And uh, welcome, everybody. Hi, Don. How hey, Don. Are you? <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, so many things to do. All right, we're a little bit early. See if anybody else is going to come in and join us here. Hope so. How you doing there, Lauren? I'm doing well, Don. How you doing today? Good. Good. Can't can't complain. Lots of changes coming up. And uh, I'm moving my web my um, newsletter to a different platform. Uh, so I'm a little nervous about that. Not getting. I saw the I saw the thing about uh, Mailchimp. Yeah, I'm just going to. Uh, I have a program that I've done that is uh, uh, 52 weeks of stuff to do every week. And I'm thinking about putting that out there. Uh, I've been right. I wrote it, finished it uh, in April. I haven't done anything with it yet. But the idea is to get a, a photographer or a creative person gets an email every week with some fairly, you know, uh, precise things to do. Uh, and it progresses on through the year. And so I'm looking at which platform it would be better to do that on. And Substack, um, I believe, will let me do that. Substack, I can have a free email newsletter, then I can have a paid subscription newsletter. So if somebody pays eight bucks a month, they get the other, that they would get this other thing in addition to. So I can still put out free content like I normally do, but I, I can also put out some uh, premium content. So we'll see. What's the temperature like there in Phoenix today? 105. 105. Hey, are you anywhere near any of the fires? I mean, is it is there a possibility they could come your way? Oh, no, no. We're down in the valley. Oh. You're in the valley. Yeah. There's a whole lot of nothing desert between us and, and trees. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, going north is a problem. So going up to... Um, Winslow, you'd ha you have to go either through Flagstaff or Holbrook now because the road uh, from Payson up to Winslow has been closed. So that's Lake Mary Road and a whole bunch of other things. Um, Pine and Strawberry, two beautiful little mountain towns, they're still evacuated. They got a big fire going. It did rain on the fire a couple of days ago, but you know, if it, if it doesn't keep raining on it, then it dries out, you know. So they said it didn't put it out, but it certainly helped the firefighters get a bead on what they needed to do. So we'll see. Uh, and then east of us is uh, there's two fires burning east of here. And if we had westerly winds, we'd probably have a lot of smoke here. But mm -hmm. this time of year, we have easterly winds. So they're blowing, blowing the smoke over to New Mexico. Um, and we've escaped it. So. Um, but it's like all the, you know, if I was to give you a list of the 10 most beautiful places to go in, in Arizona, six of them are on fire right now. Oh, jeez. Yep. It's like cherry picked. I've never seen anything like it. It's like, what do you do? Not much to do, I guess. Just does your thing. All righty. Stephanie, have they gotten uh, any control over that uh, fire down there in the Dragoons? No, it says it's like 20% contained, but it's looking a lot better, but it's, it's still going. All right. Yeah, the rain, there was enough of a sprinkle that it did help, but it's still going. Yeah, but that was like four days ago now, so. Yeah. It's, We've got some in the forecast for next week, perhaps. Yeah. Well, it said, they said the monsoon was coming in. I, we haven't had a monsoon in three years, so let's let's really hope that it does. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we've got Dennis Dunbar here today. Hey, Dennis, what's up, buddy? 
Hey, how you doing? Good. Good. To see you. I don't get to make it very often. Glad I could today. Glad to have you here. Dennis is a retoucher, a professional retoucher. Is is that what you would call a retoucher or? I guess so. You know, it's always funny when people go, I got to edit my images. Because to me, editing images is picking which one. I'm with you on that. Yeah. That's what editing, you know, post production of images is working in Photoshop. Right. But, or Lightroom or whatever. Or Lightroom. But Dennis, I, I think we've lost that war. <laughs> I've lost so many wars. I don't think we're going <laughs> to win that one again. Um, <laughs> It's like models, when models shoot with photographers now, it's TFP, which I think is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But uh, that's what it is. I always call it testing, so. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Testing, personal work, those are much better terms than TFP, but. I call it personal work, and now in the ad agencies, they call it cre uh, creative, which seems weird to me. It's like, well, isn't a lot of stuff that we do creative? Yes. Yeah, now it's Who like, knows? oh no, doing creative is doing personal work. And I'm I'm like I'm the old guy in the corner going, let's just stick with personal work then. Cause like, why do we have to change it? I don't get it. Yeah, you could you could be really creative on a on a job. Yeah. Isn't that you what can. ideally you, you want to get paid for? Yeah. Oh that's that's the thing. They call it creative now. So who knows? Yeah. As long as they pay me, as long as I get the work, they can call it anything they want. <laughs> I think, I think that the problem with the calling it testing now is like the the generation that is coming up. They're so offended because they're like, "What do you mean I have to test? I'm beautiful. My mom told me I'm beautiful. You know, of course you want to take my picture." Well, it um, <laughs> what 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 really wrecked it, Mark, was Model Mayhem, where there was no gate. Oh yeah. And so everybody with a camera could go and get a quote model, and I use that term very loosely there, could go and get a model and go shoot with them. Um, where back in the day you had to, you know, you had to jump through some hoops to get in with the agency. They just the agency didn't just grant you permission to start taking models out of the and, and photographing them. You had to work prove that you weren't uh, you know, a total degenerate. You had to show that. That the models would get something if they shot with you, um, and you know. and they provided some gatekeeper thing in terms of safety for the models as well. Yeah, safety for the models, uh, and and also uh, in a different way, safety for the photographer. If I've never shot with little Jennifer before, I'm a little reticent hiring her for a job where my ass is on the line if she can't perform, and so. Right. You would go to the agencies and you would test the model. You thought, well, I really work great with Jennifer. I don't really get along that well with Amy. So, you know, she can shoot with other photographers. And you, you build uh, that rapport. The only way you do that is testing. Um, and now, you know, you have model mayhem models who've never done a job in their life. They want $300 an hour. And, um, you know, that, that doesn't work for me. Uh, I got I to gotta shoot you first. Otherwise... We had one girl show up for a job. The client insisted on using model mayhem. So I did my typical Dom thing, which is if you want to use someone from model mayhem, which I'm recommending that you not, then you are responsible for what we get. Um, and she walks in the door and she's covered with tats. And he said, well, he's like, they were, um, swimsuits that we were shooting he goes but I, I can't shoot the tats he goes you didn't have tats on your on your um on your page she goes oh no i'm really good in photoshop just give me the pictures and i'll fix them up and send them to you and i'm like well it's just not how it's done honey it's just not how it's done so uh, interesting interesting times um let's see i just saw uh, Billy's here, Mark Lund's here, Don Dobkin's here, Denise Lee, Kevin is here, Greg is here. Hey, Greg, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, uh, it's a uh, uh, interesting and fun prospect to see where we're going. Are things opening up uh, where you are, Kevin? You getting uh, more gigs, more venues and things? 
They seem to be. Um, it, it, it's kind of kind of neat walking around and and seeing people's faces and seeing people smile and yeah. not being blocked by a mask and being able to recognize who yeah. these people are. So you know, I'm back not, it's kind of neat. Back about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, I think it was a lot of people going, well, this, this is the end of concerts. This is the end of, uh, you know, like going to Vegas to trade shows and stuff. Right. Um, I think I, I, I may have fell prey a little bit to that. I thought, you know, it's really going to change a lot. Uh, looking at uh, what's coming up in Vegas, I think, <laughs> I don't think it's going to change at all. They got, no. they got show after show after show booked. Yeah, and I think they're probably going to be packed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I as think it's well. probably going to be probably going to be packed. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, so. hey, Don. Yeah. You, you know what's uh, funny to me is how the experts, quote unquote, the experts all proclaimed this was going to happen. The world was going to change. No more convention activity like in Las Vegas, et cetera, et cetera. And meanwhile, we're just going to go back to normal again. Yeah, I, I don't blame the experts because almost every expert that I know of is an expert to make money. Yeah, they're expert in nothing. The, well, they're, and, <laughs> they're, they're quite often wrong, yep. but they still get paid for their expertise. Being an expert is, you cannot be, uh, James Altucher was, say, was sharing that he used to go on, N, on CN, or MS, not MSNBC, CNBC, the business channel, that's CNBC, right? Yeah. And, and he would go on there, but he would answer honestly. And they would ask him like some sort of weird question. He'd say, you know, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Well, on TV, you can't say that. You're really pressured to come up with an answer. You've got to have an answer, right? Yeah, wrong. Whether it be doesn't, right or wrong. Yep, doesn't really make any difference. Right. Um, they're still going and talking to Paul Ehrlich about population control. He's the guy that wrote the population bomb back in 1995 and predicted by 2005, we would all be living shoulder to shoulder and being fed with uh, artificial tubes. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb side. I think he missed that one. Just yeah. <laughs> missed that one. But he's still the expert. They still trot him out and he still pontificates. I used to think it was pretty weird. Have you ever driven across Nevada? Um, yeah, if you ever drive across yeah. Nevada, you might have a different view on the population bomb idea. <laughs> For sure. There hey, ain't Don. nobody in Nevada right now. Hey, Don. Yes, sir. You know what the, uh, you know, the root of uh, expert is, don't you? An X is a has been and a spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that, but damn, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, that, it's it's surprising to me how many experts are wrong, and it's surprising to me how many people get it right who are never given the benefit of having gotten it right. Um, for five or six years, uh, the Farmers Almanac beat NASA flat out. I mean, Farmers Almanac was like ninety percent accurate. NASA was like sixty percent accurate, but no one ever, no one ever gave them credit for it. So. Um, in photography, we have people on YouTube with massive followings who, in many cases, just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Right. I mean, just really don't. There, there's a young man, and I'm, I don't go into names or personality type, but young man, you know, his thing is walking around Pismo Beach with my RB67. Okay. You got a big old camera that shoots film. Yep. That doesn't make up for the fact that you're just shooting totally boring, mundane photographs. You're shooting them on film, but so what? The, the <laughs> medium is not the message. Anyway, I, 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 don't, I, I get a little fried. Uh, by the way, those of you who get my newsletter, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm changing the weekly newsletter over to Substack and away from MailChimp. I'll be keeping MailChimp for some things, but MailChimp is, is now uh, literally costing me $100 a month for a mailing list that's uh, 2,400 people. And um, 
it doesn't make a nickel for me. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, yeah, I could do something else with a hundred bucks a month. So I'm going to go to Substack. So for my, for my emails, which I'm not doing as often as I should, uh, but for me emails, I have a list of about 6,000 and we're using um, Wix and it's like five bucks a month. They're free. Really? Wix? Yeah. Yeah, to, to do it in MailChimp was going to be like 75 bucks a month or whatever. Oh, no, be more than that. Be more yeah. than that. Because I don't need, I have near that. I, I send out, I send out about, well, 2,600 times four. So that's almost 10,000 emails. So I send about 12,000 emails a month. And I'm, oh, like, yeah. I think about $88 now, $89. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, but uh, the, the, marketing person who's helped me do, produce these emails and send the emails out she suggested to check out wix and it used to be called shout out by wix now they call it something else i, I still have trouble figuring out how to log in she always sends me a link to log into it uh, but they let you send out email blasts for that i think you have to have a blog account with them but i never set up a website or blog anything with them i just set up the account and then we can produce the emails and send them out. Well, uh, Ma uh, MailChimp does have a very good um, prog pro uh, program. They do have a great, and what they're doing is they keep adding to it. You can now build a website on MailChimp. Are you guys aware of that? No. They have a full website building thing. So you can build your website, your email marketing, your landing page. They even send out postcards. They use... Um, uh, one of the postcard printers in, Ca in California and one in New York, they print postcards. So you can actually send them the art. They'll print the postcards and send it out. So they're building this major platform that I'm paying for and all I'm using is the email. So I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it's time I, I, I get that big list off of there and I'll probably drop down to the $20 a month program instead of the ridiculous uh, 89 now. Uh, a lot of people are also using... Um, by the way, uh, Amazon services, but you got to be kind of a coder because it's not automated. But Amazon will let you send bulk email as well through their their service. You do have to have somebody who understands the Amazon back end, which isn't quite the same as everybody else's. Uh, but once you get it set up, it's pretty smooth, pretty slick. Uh, they got the uh, um, sign up uh, lists and everything there, Dennis. Um. I think I think they do. I, the marketing person, Heather Laporte, uh, takes care of that for me. I bought her list and added my list to it, and uh, it, it's been a help because I worked out a thing with her last year, uh, right before pandemic hit, where you know for X amount she would send out so many emails, whatever, and because of the pandemic we slowed down the schedule. So this year I'm finishing them up. For the stuff and it's just been nice to have her so like hey can send another one yeah and then she organizes it and i write a blog post about it and we hooked them up for that uh so i, I don't know about the uh sign up list or whatever um a friend of mine uh uh dwayne murphy i don't know if you're familiar with him he's he's a he's been connected with ppa in down in orange county irvine area mm -hmm. um and uh, he was telling me about this whole funnels thing for that because um, he was telling me I could use email lists and, and a way to build up email lists to uh, sell online workshops. And he's telling me like, oh man, you know, once you get the system down, it's really easy to do. So I would ask Dwayne about how you set up the email, you know, signups and stuff. Now, if it's yeah, because I would it would have to have some sort of email signup system, otherwise. That's dangerous, I, I think. Just letting people throw in emails could be a little could be a little crunchy at some point. Right now, um, right now we're dealing with uh, like uh, Greg sent me two emails today from HubSpot and they didn't come in. So Google just simply blocked them. They didn't even go to my trash folder. They just wow. didn't come in. Um, email marketing has taken what is it? But they say it's almost doubled since the pandemic started. Almost email traffic's doubled. I, I can't even fathom the amount of email and the amount of spam. Is spam getting through to you guys? Because it's getting through to me. I got spam filters. I got Google. 
with the spam fund, and I still get spammed still every, get oh, every yeah. day. 10, 20, 30 a day. So anyway, well, that's cool. You know, Wix has a pretty good product too, by the way. The yeah. little website building thing, if you pay the if you pay the fee for it so you don't have the ads, it's not bad at all. Yeah, if I didn't have a good uh, WordPress guru help me out. <laughs> that guy's a jerk. <laughs> the lame, lame guy. All he, all he wants to do is ride his motorcycle and drink tequila. Trust me, I know the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and have the occasional taco. Yeah, occasionally, yeah. Well, at least if he drinks tequila, you know you can trust him. That's right. I had my I had a uh, tequila um, Bloody Mary last night. A little tartar, a little got a little more bite to it than the vodka. Wow, not bad. Interesting. Yeah, and they make one called they make one with gin too. And I totally forgot what she called it. She looked it up yesterday. Uh, Carla did. Yeah, they make a Bloody Mary with gin. I did not know that. So wow. The I guy just, who used to uh, be one of the head guys at Cutter Shelter, Grover Sanchigrin. Huh? He's, is you know Grover? Yeah. Yeah, he's really into tequila. In fact, he started his own tequila uh, distillery because he was, got so deep into tequila. It's a uh, it's a real uh, boutique thing. Um, uh, who uh, some actor uh, jo uh, George Clooney has his own tequila. Thing. Oh, and uh, Keanu Reeves has tequila. They're doing tequila as well. Um, possibly because it'd be f it's fairly inexpensive to start a business in Mexico. Yeah. I mean, it's probably beyond my revenue stream, but I mean, for someone starting a business for tequila, you go down to Mexico, you, all you need is a, an agave plant, you know, and um, some try some techniques and. and Somebody uh, knows what they're doing. The biggest expense is the bottles. It's, I mean, that's the bottom line. The biggest expense for liquor like that is the bottle you put it in. So <laughs> anyway, so what's happening out there photographically? photographically I want to, I, I have something to share with you guys, but uh, I want to find out what you guys are thinking about today. That's really sad, you know that. Well, now we're, we're thinking about tequila and uh, okay, yeah, we're on to tequila and tacos now. So we're gonna call it start calling it Taco <laughs> Friday. And uh, so in one of my groups that I belong to, for whatever reason, a question was asked, and I thought I'd throw this up to you guys as well. I'm going to give you the parameters of a job and you tell me what you think. All right. Here's the task. Over 3,000 products that vary in size up to nine feet by four feet with an average weight of 1,500 pounds. Uh, they have a 20 by 10 space to shoot it in. And the farthest point from the camera is 10 feet. Now, let me tell you the size of the space again. 20 by 10, and the space from where the backdrop is to the farthest point where the camera is, is 10 feet. So it is 20 feet wide, 10 feet deep, and they'll be shooting things that are nine feet long. Yeah, that's ridiculous. They weigh 1,500 <laughs> pounds. So if you are preparing, and I'm not going to get into the rest of it here, because I, I don't want to spoil the surprise. But if you were going to bid that, what's the first thing that you would do? Find a studio to rent? Nope. Oh, you can't. Hey. You can't. These are 3,000, 1,500 pounds, great big parts of machinery. Get a forklift. First then, thing I would do to... To do a bit is to figure out how long is it going to take me to do four shots. They want a front shot, a side shot, a different side shot, and a top shot. We can, and you can shoot the location. They want a pure white background. 
I don't even understand how it's supposed to be possible. If you've only got a 10-foot well, studio and you need a side <laughs> shot on something 20 feet long. I'm, we're, we're not to the possibility yet. I'm just trying to figure out the time. Okay. So how long would it take to put one of those into position? Let's say you set up uh, what I would call massive drop and pop lighting. The way I told him, this young man to do it is put three four by eight white foam cars on this side, three four by eight white foam cars on that side, white foam core across the back, suspend strobes from the top and blast the foam core. As far as keeping the background white, are you out of your mind? Crazy. You send it out for 15 cents a piece and have somebody do it in Bratislava or something, right? I mean, 3,000, obviously you can afford it. So how I long don't know would if, it take? Okay, I, so I, there was this thing that I saw that was sort of like you put your camera on this rod that's suspended. Instead of using a turntable, the camera turns around the object. And you can either weight the far side or put, uh, you know, a soft box on the far side, and then it rotates around it. Mm -hmm. So There's... if you set that up and suspended it across the room, it would be fairly simple to get the four sides. But you have to simple, do this quote, with unquote. you have to do this with three thousand products. Three thousand. Well, they would have to move, yeah, the products in and out. So here, what, here's what I don't know. How long would it take to do one product? So they're going to have to have some here. way to get it in there. It's 1,500 pounds. So a crane or a, a forklift. forklift, right? Which means you'd have to remove some of your lighting and your camera, back it out of the way. They can move it in and take it out. So now you've got it there. Even if you've got drop and pop lighting, like, okay, it's there. Bring the white foam cards back together. It's F11. Boom, we get the front shot. Now you got to get a side shot, boom, and a left side shot, boom, and a top shot, boom, okay? I figured, and then they got to come back in with a forklift, pick it up and take it out. I figured a half an hour per. We're going to say 40 minutes. That's 370. That is once it's been set up. That is 375 days working seven days a week. <laughs> and you're not going to do that in 45 minutes trust me from truck driving it's going to take you're you're not going to get There's wow no possible way you're going to get 16 products done in a day which you'd have to do eight hours a day 16 products every 30 minutes you got to throw in lunch in the middle for you know so you're going to be there well so that's 370 and change days to do that but wait we now have 12,000 images that have to go through Lightroom to be sharpened. The background has to be turned to white. You've got to clean this up over here and clean this up over there. So we just added another 168 days based on 15 minutes per image. Yeah. This, is the a, wall white. this is a two year project and the client has said, well, yes, we'll allow you to spend $400 on lighting. Are you nuts? He doesn't know what he's asking. That, no clue. He doesn't know. So I, I told this guy, you know, he says, well, I'm going to use the sheet vinyl for the flooring. I said, that'll work great for like the first shot. Yeah. And after you try to pick up that 1,500 pound thing, you're going to rip up the vinyl flooring. I said, paint the floor. You're going to go through hundreds of gallons of white paint. Yeah. Paint the floor. The moment they pick it up, clean up the edges, wait for the next product to come in, drop it and move your lighting back in and take the picture. I said, I would, if you do this, this way, you'll be working for, where's my numbers here? Yes, for $8.50 an hour. That's ridiculous. I told him I wouldn't touch the job for less than $750,000. That's doing, that's basically, four shots for the product, I'm charging $125 for each product. And that's $750,000. I think if I was making $750,000, I could pop for some lighting. I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I mean, lighting's expensive and shit, you know, I don't want to cut into the profit. 
But this is this is one of those jobs that this is not even possible. Oh. And and I think because the client doesn't know what he's asking, no. and not nothing will be suitable. Nothing will make sense for him. Even if you put it in black and white, this is what it takes to do yeah. it. He will not understand at all I, what he's asking. I have a process. feeling. I have a feeling that the guy who's been asked to shoot the stuff actually works for the company. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're just thinking, well, we'll do that. While you're doing that, by the way, for 370 days uh, in a row, not taking weekends off while you're doing it. They also have to have a couple of guys there running the forklift in the crane, right? So they've got three employees doing nothing but taking pictures over there. Forklift guy will be or what? crane, whatever, will be making uh, considerably more than you will be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, he's probably making thirty bucks an hour if he's on a on a good forklift. Yeah. Yep. And he's probably thinking, well, said, well, the photographer can do this with with the iPhone. We just take the the machine in and out and i think that's the way he's thinking what like, what they should put the do the camera on and that's it you know? what they should do is walk around the yard where they have all this stuff take a photograph of it send it over to korea have uh, them cut it out of the background they'll even add a little drop shadow and be done with it it's still three thousand products it'll still take a couple of weeks to do it oh, yeah. it does. Yes. and just be done with it yeah. What kind of product is it, Don? Do you know? Heavy machinery parts. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine the size. If there's a facility that's got 3,000 items to be photographed sitting in their location, they should at least have a space bigger than what they're giving for the photographs to even be done. Like, here, we're going to put it in a closet and have you take a picture of it there. I mean, that's a big facility. Yeah. That's a really big facility. And they're willing to spend $400 on film. You're right. This is the kind of job where the client really doesn't have a clue no. what they're asking for. Exactly. Well, in this, in this business, do people ever propose a pilot project where, you know, you do the first, you know, you do something like the first 20 of them to get an idea of what it's going to really take? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Seems Absolutely. Like that's what we do. That kind of goes to the whole shooting for free stuff. Like, you know, you do a job for free, you learn how to do it, you give them something, you have an idea and be like, I'll do this one for you for free so we can figure it out. And then the next time you got numbers. When we uh when I ran when we ran the agency, we wanted to get um a company in California called all called Omnicell. Uh, and they made hospital equipment. So my, my ad agency mostly handled um, medical and health related IP and uh, product companies. So uh, we were really in the medical space pretty heavy. And uh, we wanted the Omnicell account. So we pitched them and it was either gonna be us or an account in San Francisco and they were located in Los Gatos. So Los Gatos and San Francisco were across the street from each other practically and were in Phoenix. Well, we knew the agency in Los Gatos, and I didn't think they were very good. They were really expensive, and but I didn't think they were any good. So I, I said, I sort of blurted it out in a meeting without looking at my partner, by the way. When you're doing something really stupid, don't look at your partner because they might be going. So <laughs> <laughs> I blurted out, we will do an ad for, I can't remember the name of the magazine, but it was one of the uh, trade magazines that they they uh, advertise in, we'll do an ad and creative for free. And then you can measure the response on our ad, pure visual graphic ad, no, no marketing background and all, all that. We'd already done our research. We'll do it. You can measure our res the response from our ad against the response from the other ad. And we won't charge you a nickel, not a penny. And uh, the the CFO is you know sitting there. He goes, okay, let's let's do it. Let's find out. He he said, oh, an A/B test. So their their agency, their current agency, not the new one, the current agency, uh, did their ad, and we did our ad, and it cost us, I want to say about thirty five hundred dollars to do the ad. We we bought some stock from a very 
big name photographer in LA. Uh, Dennis, do you remember the guy that would shoot the, the people out like on the salt flats, the guy in the suit and he would be holding like a ball of fire? Remember that guy from about, I want to say about 95 up to 2005? Or he'd be holding a great, uh, he's like in a suit, but he's holding a great big uh, crystal ball over his head and all those, remember those? Vaguely. Yeah. I, I don't remember the photographer's name. I don't remember his name right now either, but he was pretty big at the time. Uh, and we bought one of his stock photos for a six month use. And that definitely made my partner want to strangle me. Um, we ran the ad, we got 45% more response and we got a $12 million client. So we gambled th three grand and we picked up a, a we, we had them for two years and they spent $6 million with us each year. Wow. Now, when I say a $6 million client, that doesn't mean I made $6 million. That means they spent $6 million with us and we're basically doing about 18 to 20 percent of that six million dollars which is still pretty good what's that which is still pretty good yeah yeah that definitely definitely helped a lot definitely a good uh, good client yeah real good client and we did uh we did some great we got some awards from those guys and everything stick your neck out sometimes take a risk I would say to these people, look, this is what it's going to take to do the shot the way you want to do it. And by the way, there's no way we can do it with $400 with a lighting gear. Yeah. Um, you're going to be somewhere about $1,500 to $1,600 with a lighting gear uh, to do it. And that's, you know, you're, you're talking about 12,000 shots if every shot worked. If every shot was a winner... You're talking about 12,000 finished images. So you're basically going to burn through a camera too. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, and do one and say, this is, look at the work that's going to be involved here. We're going to have to get a forklift. We're going to put it over here and then go out and shoot one of those parts on a pallet outside, send it over to, to uh, the, guy, the guys in, in Bosnia. They'll cut it out for a buck and a half and you show them say, okay, this job over here is going to cost you $750,000. This job here is going to cost you $200,000. Which one works for you? So I'm not, I would, you know, I would do it for 200,000. I would do that many images for $200,000 lump payment because it's a lump job. I'd probably be done in what? Three, three weeks, maybe thousand images a week, thousand. Yeah. About three weeks. Um, so yeah, I do it for like 200,000 plus expenses and walk away with $200,000 after three weeks of work. The problem is the last problem is what is this job worth $200,000 to these guys? Oh, hell no. <laughs> They're going to spend $200,000 to take pictures of, of old parts that they hope to sell. So Bidding photography is sometimes a challenge and you have to know the bit, this the young man who's uh, bidding this is really thinking he's, he's got to figure out a way to do this. And I'm like, my friend, my advice is walk away, walk away. You could get completely creative with it and say, look, I don't think you can afford this, but what I could do is put a little video together and just use a drone and you can let your customers pour through this stuff and you can yep. let them know which product is at how many seconds into this thing. What do you think of that? Yeah. And now you've got something that maybe could work for both sides. Take, take 10, 10 items and do a one yeah. minute video on them. Yeah, six right. seconds per you know, do a little one minute video. This is part or, number or whatever is 001 work, right? through part number 0011. Boom, done. Yeah. yeah and that way, you could do something for a, a, a reasonable price, still make a, a chunk of money, but they would be paying a small amount relative to what they could get. And it's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's a thing. And everybody could walk away yep. feeling like they got value. Hey, yeah. Don? Yeah. What kind of retail value do these items have? Well, that I, that I don't know. Because I mean, you're assuming you know, if, they're worth, if they're worth, say, you know, uh, 
on a hundred or five hundred thousand per item. It could you're right, Billy. Be, but if you're right, Billy. But if they if they were worth that value, this company wouldn't have three thousand of them sitting around. Right. Right. I mean, in some cases, it's just going to be scrap metal value. It's going to be yeah. It's going to be you know. Uh, pound by the pound and fuel you pump deliver. off a 1958 willis uh four by four you know that type of thing it's like you know it's not worth it to them and we know that it's not worth it to them because they're so far in the weeds by telling the guy he could spend four four hundred dollars on lighting they're so far in the weeds that they really don't have any value into it I would imagine if you sat down and talked to them they they were there in their mind it would have take it take a couple of days maybe a week to get it done. <laughs> Which also brings about, brings about a, a, a secondary way of looking at it too is we are creative people. And what we tend to do is we look at every job as though it requires the top line work. Let me explain. As a graphic designer, uh, maybe uh, as a graphic designer, I got a guy who walks in the door and he says, hey, Don, you know, can you do a flyer for our church picnic well yes i can i'll do a flyer for your church picnic next guy walks in the door wants a point of purchase poster for a five thousand dollar lawn care product and the third guy that walks in the door wants a a a uh, uh, annual report done for his 50 million dollar business do I treat every one of those jobs the same way? Because if I treat that flyer for the church the way I treat that that uh, uh, annual report, they can't afford me. They can't afford me. I'm going to, with the annual report, I'm going to tinker and tinker. I'm going to move this font over here. I'm going to change this font. I'm going to go back and change colors. This has to be top notch. These guys need a flyer, mm. right? They need a headline and some type and stuff. They're not going there. I'm not going to give them something to look at. And they go, oh, my God, this is a prize winning flyer that we're going to use for the Saturday night church chicken social. <laughs> we don't do that. And the guy in the middle, he's going to he's a little bit like the flyer guy because it's going to be used for a month at a store. But he's also not that annual report guy who's going to be paying me probably 10 times what I'm charging the flyer, except it's all the same thing. It's just design, but it's understanding what your client wants, what the client needs and what they can afford and being able to deliver to them something really, really good in the price range they can afford. Pricing, hey pricing photography is really hard. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think one of the important things here is to uh, understand how much these things are selling for. Because I just figured out, say if they have a $10,000 value or $5,000 value, if they're worth ten k, that's $30 million. Yeah. Now, I mean, a company could easily have something like that. I worked, um, I ran a custom motorcycle store years ago, and the guy that owned it was a Ford dealer. All right, that guy had an $80 million line of credit on his cars. It's called floor planning in the automotive industry. All right, he had an $80 million floor plan limit. $30 million in, in a big business really is nothing. Yeah, I just, I'm just, what I'm saying is I got from the post that they did, I did not get the feeling that they were ultra valuable things. Mm -hmm. But I am going to put that in there too. Well, it's the same thing. We talk, when we talk about photography, though, it's the same thing. Uh, you're talking about the value of the photography uh, and the value of the item. And we've said this before. If let's say you've got a little 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 uh, Mary Lou comes over for a headshot, Mary Lou's an up and coming model for your local agency. Mary Lou comes over for a headshot. What's a headshot going for in, in LA now, Kevin? About two fifty. 250, 300 bucks. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah 250 because it's for, it's for her. It's for Mary Lou, right? And then her agent shows that, that headshot to this guy. And the guy goes, oh, shit, I'm a head, head buyer for Maybelline. I'm going to call Maybelline. Maybelline says, yeah, we want Mary Lou for a six-month buyout 
50 consumer magazines. Uh, so get that, get that photographer. Mary Lou comes back, same hair, same makeup, same girl, same light. It's not $250 anymore, right? right. It's, I mean, it might be $25,000 because the value of the image to Maybelline is far higher than the value of the image to Mary Lou. They, if if uh, that picture of that model increases sales by 0.7%, that's millions of dollars. It's, it's not like 80, well, we made 80 bucks more this month. No, it's millions of dollars. Plus, if they're in 60 consumer magazines, and they easily could be, if they're in 60 consumer magazines, they're probably spending somewhere about a million a month just to place the ads. So certainly you're going to get a part of that. That's part of the value of what we do. Like I say, pricing photography. There's, there's no secret. There's no rhyme or reason for it. You just got to do your research find yeah. out what other people are charging find out what the industry is paying well that was where i was going to go with it because the the value is also impacted by who else they'd be willing to use and what they'll charge yeah so um you know yeah it could be twenty five thousand dollars but they're not going to pay more than eight because fred's not bad and he'll do it for eight we, we, I had a Project 52 member who was with the, the group for you know, almost 40 weeks before he let it be known that he was an art director. Not only was he an art director, he was an art director for a really big agency in San Francisco. And not only was he an art director for a really big agency in San Francisco, he was the lead art director. And he loved the class. He said, he, uh, one of the classes he said, okay, I'm going to tell you, this is how the business works. He says, I pitched Don for two jobs here at the agency. And they said, yes, his work is good, but no, because he's never shot a $100,000 job before. So even if you're really good, if you've never shot a $100,000 job before, they may not let you shoot your first $100,000 job for them. The just the comfort factor is just not there. So they said, yeah, his work is good. Yep, we could do it. They, they shot a, a woman standing next to an Audi on a circular drive in front of a house. The shot took uh, two flies, two uh, uh, saw, uh, scrims, flying scrims. That was all the lighting was. Natural light, two flying scrims, beautiful woman standing next to a uh, side of an Audi in front of this really beautiful house uh, up in uh, 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 somewhere around the, the hills of, of San Francisco. They got the uh, Italian photographer. I think it was named Emmett. He's really. Uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Uh, yeah, he's really famous. But anyway, they got him to do it. He charged one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars for that shot. They were in at eight and left at ten thirty. <laughs> I told the art director guy that I said, dude, I would have done it for 119,000 just flat. I mean, <laughs> I'd even bought everybody lunch. Hell but yeah. Honestly, it didn't matter to them because they had the budget. You discount, budget. you discount are you. When, uh, when we were doing the work for um, PeopleSoft, we had to do an ad and there's a, there's a road up on, on Houston. I believe it's Houston. Uh, and if you look down the road, it's where the Transamerica building is on it so there's that corner and i believe or is it market one of them runs at an angle so the, the the road runs from it but at a sharp line going down the hill trans america that's where we scouted we said this is where we're going to do it and there was a guy with a briefcase and then people around him moving so they would be blurred but he would be still for this ad for people soft 27 magazines going to go in so we scouted it they said get three bids and they gave us a list of people to bid from. And they got a, a, a really good shooter in Los Gatos. Uh, I think he's just retired. He, his bid was 75. It was a guy from New York, uh, uh, Peter Toloni, I think it was, uh, that uh, he bid um, 140. Uh, and then uh, uh, Geller, what's his, uh, not Geller. Um, Jurgen Teller. Jurgen Teller, J U E R G E N. Jurgen Teller bid a quarter million dollars for the shot. 
Who did PeopleSoft use? Jurgen. Jurgen. Yep. Yep. That way their CEO could sit at lunch with another CEO and brag about the fact that he spent a quarter million dollars in the shot. Jurgen Teller was an absolute consummate professional. He came in. They, his team came the day before. They got permits from the city. They power washed the wall of the bank where we were shooting. They power washed it. They power washed the street and the sidewalk because the bums peed all over the, the, the street there. The, the, the sides of the bank were just urine stained. He cleaned it all up. He had new street signs put in. At least they were put in for the shoot. Uh, the whole thing. Uh, he charged a quarter of a million dollars. We were in. Uh, we got there at five in the morning. We shot at, uh, I believe, nine o'clock, between nine o'clock and 10 o'clock. This was still film. You're shooting Hasselblad. Uh, I think he burned through 50 rolls of film. Uh, we packed it away. He took the whole crew to lunch uh, and he was out of there by two o'clock, quarter of a million dollars. I bid the same, same job with one of my really, really good photographer friends in Phoenix, 8,000. <laughs> who, who paid for the cleaning and the new sign? He did, he did. He paid, came out of his 250, hmm. yeah. That he didn't itemize any of that stuff came out of his 250. Which makes sense. Yeah. It was it was what are you, what are you paying? Are you paying for the photography? Or are you, are you paying for the, the bill? So when he made the bid, he said, I'm mean, you know, it's gonna be this much, this much, we're gonna spend five hundred dollars in power cleaning, we're gonna spend three hundred and fifty dollars. So your 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 bid, you know, if you looked at the bid, you're gonna go, Oh my god, this guy's thorough as hell. Yeah, he was thorough as hell. Um so it was in the bid, but it wasn't. Um, uh, but it, that that bottom line of uh, two hundred fifty thousand. And by the way, have you ever noticed that photographers never uh, ever have uh, bids that that are not zeros on the end? Did you ever notice that? Never seen a bid for you know nine hundred and thirty-seven dollars and sixty-two cents. I just never seen one. <laughs> It'd be like. $900 or $950 or $1,000. It's never $1,011, $1,011.22. It's like- Sounds like you did more math if you have an odd number. We just see for tires, we, they, we all be going, oh God, now I got to figure a percentage of 11 cents. Oh shit. <laughs> it sounds like it's are, people, really are people Are price. people paying for the, the ph photography or are they paying for the experience that's being provided? Well, the shot came out really good. It didn't come out any better, that I think, than uh, than uh, Dave Siegel could have done out of Phoenix for eight grand. I didn't see anything else in it. Whether Dave would have power washed the walls or not, I'm not sure, but I imagine that if he'd gotten there and seen the shape of the walls, he would have power washed the walls as well. Um, you, you couldn't shoot it any other way. I mean, it just would have yeah. looked terrible. Remember, this is pre, well, this is Photoshop, Four, maybe, maybe Photoshop four before layers. So I think four, four was the last one. Layers were introduced in five, I believe. So and we, we didn't have the luxury of all that. We were still, in fact, um, two months before we did that job, we were actually over in, in LA. This is going to make Dennis smile. We were over in LA sitting at a big booth at a place called SciTech. The old sight oh, yeah. test machine. Yes, sir. It was a video. It was a uh, vision, a visual editing machine. So you could take that car and they could cut it out of the background and put it on a new background. But there was no transparency. There was no way to make the shadow under the car blend with the background. So it was always kind of cut out looking, right? $500,000 unit. And they went belly up. SciTech went belly up in about literally about four months. Photoshop 5 hit the, hit the market and SciTech was gone in about four months. Yeah, there were a number of companies that made those big machines. Uh, Quantel Paint Box. Yep. Quantel, yep. Uh, yeah. And th those companies made a lot of money early on but they were like you know million dollar machines in those days you had to have a lot of money and they charged like a thousand dollars an hour i was gonna say we paid we paid a uh, twelve hundred dollars an hour for SciTech 
And when you went in, it was like a video editing booth that you would see now. They had leather chairs and you would sit in the chair and they would bring you wine and there would be two technicians working. I mean, to, I mean this was like, I don't know what they were using, but it was probably some, some sort of Windows application to do this stuff. It wasn't drag and drop. It was, you know, type and something would move and type and something, you know, so these very highly skilled people, but we, we paying $1,200 an hour uh, for a couple of uh, shots we did for a client in New York. So yeah, and there were no side tech machines in Phoenix. Uh, there were two in LA, uh, one in Dallas, two or three in New York, one in Chicago, and I believe there was one in Miami, somewhere there, down. There was Raphael in down in Houston that had a, yeah. uh, she, she never said what kind of machine they had. She always kept everything behind a, a curtain. Nobody got behind the curtain. They could have had squirrels painting in the back. <laughs> yeah, and, be, and before that, we would be using uh, we would be using uh, dye transfer prints and airbrush. Um, uh, and those two guys in New York, uh, you know who they are, Dennis, like the Italian name Giuliani or Giuliani or something. Mm -hmm. um, they're still in business. They're still they're still they're mostly Photoshop now, but uh, yeah, they're still in business that you'd, you'd send your picture off and they would make a die transfer, which right off the bat was probably six, $700 to make a 16 by 20 die transfer. They'd paint right on the die transfer and then re-photograph transfer onto four by five sheet film. And that's what you use to make the uh, separation boat. Yeah, Things have changed drastically. The photographer I uh, uh, started working with early on uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, uh -huh. William Warren, I think you might have uh, talked to him a few times. He'd be compositing by hand in the dark room using litho masks and things. He created some amazing composites. How's um, he doing, by the way? Oh, he's okay. He's okay. He's um, uh, moving his stock imagery over to, uh, to Alamy. And then they just got a note like, oh, all the stuff from super stock the names on the on the keyword list don't match our names, so you're gonna to have to hand make all the names match. So he's kind of freaking out. <laughs> I'm gonna do metadata work. Um, but uh, he's he's doing okay. Good. Doing okay. Good. Good. Um, yeah, but it, William used to make these amazing composite stuff. I worked at a rental house in the late '80s in LA called PRS, and he would make uh, ads for them, and the ads were so well done. You know, he had a, a thing, he called it the uh, Megatronic Camera of the Gods. So it started off with a uh, six by seven, Pentax six by seven body, you know, the one that looked like a giant 35 yep. millimeter SLR. Yep. And he stripped on video camera handles. He had antenna coming out of the back. On the back, he had a screen. He had a, a dot matrix printer on the back and all the stuff. And, you know, this camera did all these magic things. And it was totally a made up thing. We were getting orders from Australia. Like, when, when is this camera available? When can we rent this camera? <laughs> and he just shot a bunch of stuff and stripped together in his darkroom. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so they would, uh, <clears throat> some of the stuff we sent off to the New York folks to have uh, die transfers made. They actually had to do that. They'd, they'd take the, the bottles of, uh, medicine stuff off of the product shot and they would strip them by basically cutting out a mat physically cutting out a mat putting it under the enlarger with pin registration you all know mm -hmm. what pin registration is right everything slips on top of that pin to keep it registered and then putting that on um onto the image and then going back with an airbrush and adding just that little bit of shadow that might be needed um, and because well, again, no transparency, we didn't have transparency that, uh, and they, they would do that and, you know, costing a fortune. I bet William made really good money doing that shit. That was hard to do. Oh yeah. So I, I do have, um, a short story and a yeah. couple of images if, um, if yeah. you want to see them, but that, so the, another example of how it's good to get out, um, you, you can share. Colorado, I, I just had a couple of hours where I could break away. Yeah, if you'd let me share the screen, I'll share pictures. But let me just talk about it briefly first. I um, 
I just had a couple of hours to spare while my wife was with her mother. And I got on a, a cruiser that the hotel, the little hotel had and threw my camera around my neck and decided, what am I going to do? There's all in Coronado, it's loaded with bunting and flags. So I just thought, well, let me take a bunch of pictures of how people use them. Um, because, you know, I'm just looking for a theme, something I can do briefly. And I came up, so I, I was doing that for a while and I came upon this house that was particularly interesting to me. And there was a lady in the front yard. So I took a picture and then asked if she would be willing to pose. She said, no, but Tom is very proud of this. Let me go get him. So Tom comes out and Tom turns out to be uh, a member of the 101st paratrooper unit that followed the invasion of D-Day to the parachuted into France. And he's still, he's still parachuting now. His 100th birthday is August 15th. <laughs> and they plan for his 100th birthday to have him jump out of a plane again in San Diego. So he's, he's a celebrity that I didn't even know existed. He um, is, uh, you know, there's a book written about the entire invasion process and his role and his story of, of the people around him. Numerous articles, you know, he, he gets invited everywhere. I just happened to see a house that looked interesting and he was more than happy to visit with me. So I didn't have very much time. He's almost a hundred, couldn't move him around too much. He, I'm sure when he jumps, he's got somebody with him because he's not, you know, it's hard for him to navigate elevation changes even in his yard. But um, if you give me the con, I'll show a couple pictures. Yep, you got it. Okay. So this is the house. I, you know, I saw the peace sign and the flag and I thought, this is really interesting. And then she went and grabbed him and I had him pose for that. And then, um, let me just, this is a closer look at him. Um, again, sure. he'll be a hundred years old in, you know, less than two months. Uh, and he'll be jumping. So, you know, all I had was a camera slung around my back. I had no light. I had, you know, couldn't move him around very much. But um, it just kind of shows that you never know what you'll run into if you just go outside with your camera. Oh, yeah, you're so right. Just take your camera outside. Just go walking around. Don't and stop when, yourself from taking any picture. It's not film even anymore, folks. It's digital. Just the whim hits you, take the picture. You got nothing to lose. Yeah, and so... I really wasn't ready for this. And I thought as I, as I left, you know, he gave me a couple apples um, and uh, that are on the tree behind him. He, he stumbled and kind of went down to one knee um, because his, his um, significant other had been trimming the tree when I walked in. So he kind of tripped over a branch and, and got him back up on his feet. Um, but he wanted to give me marigolds for the mother-in-law and he gave me a couple of apples. And if I had had my wits about me, I would have realized I should ask if I could go inside, get a quick documentary of him so I could write a whole story. I rode my bike away, came back, you know, six minutes later and it was too late. They had closed down and he'd given me a card, but they weren't ready to work with me or communicate with me over the next couple of days. So I'll send them these images. I was just finishing these images when you started the call. Um, so I'll shoot them off to them. Maybe I can get down there again before the 15th. And everybody's already done all the stories there are to do about the actual war and his experience in the war. I mean, there's an entire book, but there could be a really nice story about what his life is today. Sure. That nobody's doing. And so um, I would love to do that with him if he's, you know, interested and willing and get back down there before the 15th. What a, that would be fabulous. That would be fun. So if you're interested, his name's Tom Hill, 101st Air, uh, Airborne, and you Google him, you'll, you'll find all kinds of stuff about him. 100 years old. Not yet. Month and a yeah. half. <laughs> he's 99 and 10 and a half months. And there will be a big event. There will be a big... You know, the army has uh, helped pave the way and they'll have, you know, everything they need for him to 
jump. I think he jumped out of a plane last when he was 97 or 98. Couldn't do it last year for COVID. Um, but um, he'll be doing that, uh, you know, uh, God well, willing, he's still as well then as he is today, then he'll be doing it in a month and a half. Yep. Sounds cool, man. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah. And it was like, uh, well, Eric uh, Munities went out with his camera one afternoon just to do the same thing and was walking down along the docks and ran into a, a fairly famous blues singer with his guitar and they became pretty good friends. Uh, the, the, the gentleman passed away and very devastating to Eric because they'd only known him for about a year and a half, but he became this uh, guy's like personal photographer, this old gentleman, and it was just a blast. But like Eric said, it was the first time he'd walked out with his camera just to go and do something. And he ended up making some good photographs, meeting some interesting people. One place you will never meet interesting people is sitting in a chair behind your computer. <laughs> except that the, except all the very young um, and obviously poor women who want to be my friend. I know they're poor because the poor things can't even afford much clothes. <laughs> no. You know, it must be terrible to have to spend your day in underwear. I mean, this is gross, but they, they all want to be my friend on Facebook. I, I, I rarely say yes, because I know they're just going to ask me for shoes. So, Mr. Dotkin, I see that gentleman is a four-star general. I don't know if you mentioned that when you were talking. No, um, I did not realize that. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's not that I Googled it when you said that, and I looked him up, and it said he's a four-star general. Damn. I didn't know that either. <laughs> that's up there. And you know what a four-star general is? I mean, that's like, I sat across from a four-star general once, and, you know, the room just stood still. They only go to five-star, right? Yeah. That's the way it is. Did I say Hill? I meant Thomas Rice. Did I say Hill? Hill. No, it's Thomas Rice. Oh, I looked up Tom Hill. Yeah, no, 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 no. Tom, I, for some reason, Hill has got stuck in my head and I keep trying to dislodge it. His name's Tom Rice. The book is Trial by Combat, a paratrooper of the 101st Airborne. Tom's probably trying to get some of those women with very little clothes out of his mind every once in a while. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you, when you're when you you know you've reached a certain level of maturity when you go to the car shows and and you start telling the models to get out of the way of the cars, like, <laughs> get off my car. Can you get can you get them girls away from that car? I need a picture of that their car. <laughs> and all them girls are all flopped over it and get them something to wear. Them poor sweethearts, they need some. They need a couple of burgers too. They all skinny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right guys what a what a far-reaching and wildly diverse photo <laughs> talk friday this was how fun yeah. that is uh lee just uh stay close i'll send you a link sounds good we're gonna go over lee's portfolio uh, um dennis have you seen uh the agency yet no yeah i haven't uh I have an agency based on based on my um, Project 52. I, I have all this uh, wonderful talent at Project 52. And we have created an agency that we're um, blogging every day all right that's not working why is that not working oh here that's what i need to do and then i got to come down here and do this again this is the agency visual media strategy oh um, and we've got the uh, photographers and every photographer has uh We've got the by location here, so you can search by location. Um, nice. We're slowly adding folks. 
Uh, and um, every photographer then has uh, like their, their own page. So you can go to Teresa and see her page. So she's got samples. You can talk directly to Teresa down here, send her a note. And if you subscribe, you get free pictures. Uh, so every month we put up one free picture from each member. I believe it's this one. Uh, no. Now I can't remember. Can't remember the name of that uh, that page. But anyway, uh, you get a free picture and. Uh, those pictures are up for three months. They each month put up a new set of uh, pictures. And then by the end of the third month, the fourth month goes up and the first month comes down. So create a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, emergency to it, you know, a little bit of time structure. Uh, but uh, we're, we're getting out onto the search engines and uh, trying to make some headway that way. Pretty excited about it. All right, guys, I'll let you go. Everybody have a great one. Uh, thanks, thanks, Don, for sharing that with us. And we'll see you all next time. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.